Hi, my name is Anna Middleton and I'm Head of Society and Ethics Research at the Wellcome Genome Campus in Cambridge. I'm going to be talking to you about how society interacts with genomic technology and this is largely influenced by doing large-scale research on global public attitudes towards genomics. I'm an experienced genetic counsellor, having worked in clinic, education, research and policy in this field, and I'm also a psychologist. I have a real passion for cross-disciplinary working with colleagues from the film, advertising and art industries, and that's going to be shown in today's presentation. And I have um, conflicts of interest in that I do consulting work for both Raremark and Congenica. In this presentation, I'm going to be showing you several films that we've made. These are on exploring perceptions of genomics, technical language barriers in genetic counselling, how to build a bridge to engage about genomics, and addressing perceptions about what genetic counsellors actually do. I'm also going to show you some empirical data on awareness of genomics and draw some conclusions on the implications of this work for clinic and also policy. But the entirety of what my presentation is about is about how to build a bridge to public audiences to orientate and engage and then involve them. All communication with members of the public needs to start with establishing a connection. So whether that's in genetic counselling, a connection needs to be made with the patient or whether that's in public engagement. The patient or the person will often come with subconscious preconceived ideas about what to expect from genomics. It's almost like it's a baggage of misconceptions. There may be an expectation of hierarchy, elitism, it's not for me, it's too sciencey, and these are all perceived barriers that the counsellor or the engagement expert needs to overcome. And particularly within genetic counselling, it's really hard to participate in a reciprocal model of genetic counselling if the patient is preoccupied by these perceptions. I'm just going to share with you a couple of pieces of empirical work that we've done on public uh, awareness really about what genomics is. Um, so this is a study from a few years ago where we ascertained the views of a representative British public and we asked them when you hear the word genomics how would you rate your understanding of what it actually means? And we found that only 18% said they had a good understanding and most had either not heard the term before or had heard of it but had very little understanding. And when you broaden this out to other public audiences across the world um, and ask about um, awareness or familiarity of DNA genetics and genomics, then you do find similar things. So this is from a study that we've um, done on public attitudes towards uh, genomic data sharing. Um, and we've gathered data from uh, 37,000 people in 22 countries um, in 15 different languages. And you'll see from this slide, um, the graph shows that uh, familiarity with the concepts of DNA genetics and genomics is really quite low. So if you look at the um, light green bars, um, that, that tells you um, people who've answered that they're very unfamiliar with these concepts. Um, and then the um, turquoise colour uh, shows those who are just generally familiar either through popular culture or through having direct-to-consumer testing or through the media. And then those with the dark turquoise bars um, are showing that they have their familiarity through having a personal family history of something um, inherited. And you can see um, down the left-hand side the different countries that this refers to um, with the representative public in each of these different countries. So outside of Italy and the United States, uh, most countries, the general public, have very little familiarity with DNA genetics and genomics. So we can't automatically assume that when we start talking to somebody about these issues that they'll be following what we're saying. So what's in a name? Um, if the first contact that's made with either the patient or the member of the public or the engagement material has the word genomics in it, um, then this has the um, ability to, to actually alienate people if they've really got no clue what the word genomics means and very little awareness about what goes with uh, genomic medicine. And so when we're thinking about how to help society interact with genomic technology, we need to be aware of the language that we use. And that's not just in the clinic itself and in the engagement 
interaction. It's in the letter-headed paper that we send to people. It's in the literature that we send. It's in the website material that we present. And just to be very aware that if we want to make a connection with people, um, that the way we do that is incredibly important and the words that we use may actually be delivering quite a lot of unnecessary baggage. And so we need to think right at the beginning about that first impression um, and try to uh, use some language that counteracts this so that a connection can be made. So just to bring some literature into this discussion, we know there is a recognised hierarchy of power across healthcare and that paid professionals tend to be occupying more dominant positions than members of the public. And this sort of leads us to believe that the role of patients' attitudes and beliefs should not be underestimated as these perceptions create obstacles in the environment that patients themselves have to manage. So you can see there's an awful lot going on before a consultation has even started, before a piece of engagement has even been done. And so the genetic counsellor or the engagement expert has to do uh, quite a lot to try and rebalance this power. And they can do that by the words that they use, their body language, uh, their website content, but also most importantly, their humility and their congruence and their genuine approach to communication. And to top it all, if a patient is coming to see a genetic counsellor in clinic, they not only have all of this baggage, um, perceived baggage from their, from their perception, but also they have the um, particular uh, reason for coming to the clinic to start with, you know, a family history of a condition or a need to have genetic testing or uh, to discuss the results of a genetic test and what can come with this and what can overlay on top of all of this baggage is fear, nerves and a fight or flight response. So a key take home message up to this point in the presentation is that we need to recognise that the patient or public may bring many different preconceived ideas about what genomics is and what it can offer. And as communicators, we need to use our language, whether that's spoken, written, body language, uh, website content, letters, and our humility and congruence to rebalance power differentials. So moving on to specific language barriers in the clinic, I've noticed um, genetic counsellors and also public engagement experts um, will fall back on a communication pattern um, that they just get used to regularly using without noticing or checking if people are actually following. And our data shows that people are unlikely to be following. Um, and the risk is that by continuing with a, a usual patter, that you risk reinforcing a power differential between yourself and the person you're talking with. And so, for example, things like um, genetic counsellors might say, oh, uh, you have a spelling mistake in a gene. Um, or they might say, we all have 20,000 genes. And what both of these things really rely on is an understanding and an appreciation, firstly, of what a gene is and how many genes is large or small and compared to what. Um, but also uh, when thinking about the spelling mistake metaphor, that's relying on an appreciation that DNA is made up of letters um, and that if those letters are changed, i.e. a spelling mistake happens, that that is significant. Um, and we've got no evidence, actually, that uh, lay public know any of these things. Um, and so I'd say it's OK to use some science, but to think carefully about the difference between what they need to know, for example, to make decisions or choices versus what you're just used to saying. It's really important not to dumb things down so much that you risk infantizing the information but the bottom line is to just keep asking yourselves like uh, things like um, do people actually need to know this um, or do they just need to have some lay interpretation so instead of saying you know in every consultation DNA is made up of A's, T's and G's do they need to know that or could you say something like um, there's a glitch in the DNA that's caused the condition in the family Talking about the word glitch, we ran a project called Socialising the Genome. And this was a really nice um, collaborative project working with storytellers from the advertising industry. And we did focus groups with members of the British public um, who were completely disconnected from the genetics field. And we explored with them um, what their thoughts were about alternative terms to some of the science. Um, and we, what we wanted to do was to find the human story behind some of the scientific um, terms such as pathogenic 
variant and sequencing and uh, what DNA actually is and does. And we published this work in The Lancet um, and the outcome of this project was a set of films that we evaluated exploring some of these terms. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you um, the film that was made about Glitch to try and describe what this actually means. Um, and for all of our films, they've been picked up in various film festivals. And so you'll see the film laurels underneath the video, which just shows that um, the story in this film does speak to a public audience and is recognised as a, as, a, as a way to communicate something interesting. For all of our love of perfection, there's nothing we love more than a good glitch, twitch or flaw. Something so much more human about our little quirks and imperfections. Have you noticed that when we want to make something really lovable and human, we give them a glitch? That's because it's our glitches that make us, us, the code of our unique selves. They can also tell us about our health and well-being. Where do they come from? Glitches are a family affair. They get passed along the DNA line and can pop up almost anywhere. Most are amazing, but there is always the chance of one or two baddies. A few glitches can cause trouble all by themselves. Others only get tricky in bad company. And some are all mouth and trousers, big threats and not much else. Good or bad, our glitches have a part to play in everything from our intelligence to our heartbeat. So, if you ever wanted to know a bit more about your glitches, your DNA would be a great place to start. We started the Socialising the Genome project back in 2015 and from that time onwards we did a lot of presentations and media around the need for genomics to be socialised so that everyday people could feel it related to them and not just the scientists and healthcare experts. The project was done for Genomics England and at the time we were delighted that our terminology made it into the introduction to the Chief Medical Officer's Generation Genome Report. It was great to see very deliberate attempts to counteract the science jargon in a sociable way. And I'd say if the Chief Medical Officer can do this, then it's fine for genetic counsellors and scientists to do it too. Now, I'm not suggesting that we own or have any level of copyright over the term glitch, but I am really delighted to see that um, in popular culture and in media, and in other resources that are out there, um, glitch has very easily translated into the genetics communication world. And this is really just validation that this um, socialising of the concepts is acceptable and, it's, and it actually works. It helps to communicate the concepts easily and simply. So this now brings me on to the Music of Life project, which is a different piece of research that we're actually doing at the moment with the team of genetic counsellors from Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge in the UK, and here they are in the picture. Um, and this is where we wanted to explore new framings and metaphors for explaining genomics. And together, we came up with the concept of music as a possible new metaphor to, to try. Um, and we created a set of films, again, bringing in the expertise of advertising and film industry um, collaborators. Um, and these films are now being used in the genetic counselling clinic to explain really basic concepts about uh, dominant inheritance, recessive inheritance, what de novo is, what pathogenic variant is, the outcomes of a genetic test. Um, and I'm going to show you on the next slide uh, one of the films. Um, this is called What is a Gene? And this is the introduction film. And it really aims to just, again, socialise the concepts, make them... Um, approachable, easy to understand for everybody. That's, that's the aim of this piece of work and uh, we're, we're gathering data at the moment whether they actually work or not. Genes are incredible things. To understand what genes are and how they work, it sometimes helps to imagine them as something we know. So next time you think genes, think music in all its wonderful endless variety. Genes are like songs made up of DNA notes and chromosomes are like the albums containing songs. Like music, our genes can impact every aspect of our lives. Sometimes in obvious ways and sometimes in ways we don't realise. Like our music collections, everyone's genes are different. It's how they're brought together that makes us us. And like our musical taste, 
Our genes are a mixture of what we inherit from mum and dad, as they did from our grannies and grandads. And sometimes we discover something entirely new and uniquely our own. So the next time you hear about genes, think music and see where that takes you. So the take home message up to this point in the presentation is, is really to suggest that you take a leap of faith and have the confidence to break out of your usual medical models of communication. Um, avoid using the set patter that you're used to using and learn from you know, how communication is done in the media, popular culture and outside of science. We're now going to move on to showing how we've built a bridge to public audiences to engage them in research. So this is the Your DNA, Your Say study gathering public attitudes from across the world towards genomics and genomic data sharing. And here is the survey um, translated into various different languages. We have 15 different translations um, from around the world. Um, and we sit films in the survey and the films are there to orientate, engage, um, take away the hierarchy, give the messaging that if a child can understand this, it's easy to understand, this is for you. Um, and the films we worked very hard on um, to try and um, explain genomics, but without using the word genomics. Uh, we knew from our previous research that more people have heard of DNA than genomics or genetics, and so we use the word DNA information for genomic data. Um, and so in the next slide, I'm going to show you one of the films that sits in the survey, and it helps to keep people engaged in, in the survey, attached to it, um, and hopefully enjoying participating, giving their views. <laughs> There's a lot of personal stuff about us online. Ah, my school photo. I can see my maths results here. And here's my family tree. Medical information can also be online. Doctors save symptoms on the computer. It's all stored securely. DNA information can be online too. DNA can tell us about our health. This person's DNA, found in her saliva, is very similar to her relatives. Does that make it special? Here's all the information we need to collate. Time to put it somewhere safe. And if these shelves are inside a computer, this is where I'd keep them. The information is all electronic. Some databases are public and available to anyone. Some databases need authorization and a key. What if your DNA and medical information was in an online database? I couldn't resist uh, showing you some data from the Your DNA, Your Say project. So just a reminder, we have 37,000 completed surveys from 22 countries in 15 languages. And one of the things that we explored was the concept of exceptionalism. Um, so when we gave a little bit of background information about D DNA and um, what it can tell us about the body, and that was given in one of the films, um, we then asked about you know, whether people thought that this was the same as other health information or whether there was something different or special about it um, compared to other medical data. So you can see in this slide, and we've got all the different countries in alphabetical order, and we have representative public audiences responding from each country. You can see there's no sort of uniform response to this. So for some countries, um, the majority don't think that DNA information is different um, to other medical information. And for others, they do think it is different to medical information. Now that in itself is understandable and not too surprising. But what's interesting is that we've found that those with exceptionalist views, i.e. they do think there's something different, about DNA information to other health data. Um, and they were saying things like, well, it links me to my relatives. It can tell me about my past, present and future health. I can pass it on to my children. 
what we found was people who had those views were more willing to donate their data for research. And that result is shown pretty consistently in this slide. So what we're looking at here is that the um, blue bars on the right hand side um, for each country are those people who um, do see DNA information as different to health information and are uh, willing to donate their data. Um, and on the left hand side is the red bars that saying, uh, so less of them basically are saying that they feel that DNA information is the same or they're unsure about this really in respect to other health data. So there's a definite association with willingness to donate data. And so that sort of tells us something about how this information could be framed when talking about um, participating in research. Um, you know, one could offer um, some information in a helpful way to explain you know, that DNA information um, does tell us interesting and different things to other sorts of health data. So within this presentation so far, we've discussed some of the um, perception barriers that might um, play a part in disrupting the genetic counselling consultation. We've talked about some of the specific language barriers in clinic. And we've also talked about uh, the necessity to build a bridge to public audiences. Um, to engage them in research, but also conversations about genomics. Um, and then I wanted to finish with um, a recognition that just the title genetic counsellor, of course, as we all know, who are genetic counsellors, has the ability to confuse uh, patient audiences as to what it is that we actually do. Um, and so within our filmmaking repertoire, we particularly wanted to um, do something to address this. Um, and so when I was chair of the Association of Genetic Nurses and Counsellors, which finished last year, um, we wanted to create a series of filmed resources um, of genetic counsellors talking in their own voice about what has touched them about working with patients. And so the final film I want to show you is a montage of different genetic counsellor voices talking about their experience of being a genetic counsellor wrenching cases stay with me even though I haven't practiced clinically for quite a while now. Ooh, thinking about a complex case it was a, a lady who came to me who had a neurological condition in the family. She was at risk of carrying and developing symptoms of later on. A case I remember very well was a case of a young man who wanted testing for Huntington's disease. He was well, he had no signs of the condition, but his father had it. A difficult case that comes to mind was a couple who had conceived and the pregnancy was going along fine but then quite late in the pregnancy during one of the scans some abnormalities were noticed. This uh, patient of mine was coping not only with his own terminal diagnosis and, and the knowledge that he wasn't going to be around for his children um, but wanting to uh, uh, be part of and support the knowledge around their genetic status and their risk of carrying the same gene as him. Testing diagnosed a rare recessive condition which was really very serious and so the couple made the really difficult decision to terminate that pregnancy. It was quite late in the pregnancy. He was a young man on the threshold of the rest of his life. He was taking a major opportunity to do with his work. They then conceived again naturally not long afterwards and that, that time because the diagnosis was known they were able to have a CVS early on. He was also making plans for children with his partner. She was in her late 30s. She was at that stage in her life where she really wanted to have a child but absolutely wanted to avoid passing the condition on. Patients who carry genetic conditions can offer, often describe a, a sense of, of guilt that they may pass that condition down to their children. It showed a, a second affected pregnancy and they had a termination earlier this time. Three out of the four children unfortunately had inherited um, his faulty gene. Having gone through two really traumatic terminations, one late and one early, they were considering whether they would want to then go down the route of PGD, which would take them out of the, the scenario of having to have prenatal diagnosis and termination, but would put them into a situation of having to go through IVF, even though they were fertile and, and didn't really like the idea of medicalising things that far. The children began, got to an age when they were old enough to hear about the gene and to start to understand that they needed screening for a condition that um, in fact meant that they had lost their father um, at a very young age. I saw him twice and we spent a lot of that time talking with him and his partner about the reality that their lives together 
might end up with her caring for him. Seeing her go through all that, those hosts of emotions, dealing with firstly the chance of having this condition herself and, and the effect that has on a person and their, and their life, their job, their friendships with people. Sadly, the result was not what either of us wanted. He had the gene he would get the condition. To be sharing that moment with her, I think, was um, really powerful. When I saw him for follow-up, he said that although the news was not what he wanted, it was still positive, because he was able to use it to move on with his life. To help guide her through that, through to thinking about reproductive options, um, and helping her come to, to what she felt was, a, was a, a comfortable decision for her moving forward. Those very difficult decision-making processes was what I was helping them to, to work through the pros and cons of those different options. It's a hard one for me, it's one of the ones that sticks in my mind. All patients affect you, but that patient affected me quite deeply. While we may say, from a guideline point of view, that's a straightforward um, situation, you have a gene test, you go for screening, the reality for families is, is very different. And so to conclude, I've got four points. It's really important to recognise that patient and public audiences may have their own preconceived ideas about what genomics genetics is. Um, and this is enough, and we have evidence for it, to create power differentials. And so we need to do all we can where we see this to address these um, differences. And we can do that using our language, whether that's spo spoken or written language, whether it's our body language in clinic, um, whether it's the way we present written material or website material. But most importantly, it's about having humility and congruence and um, really putting our audience at the heart of the conversation um, and doing our best to translate the complex science for people so that they can make meaning of it and make sense of it. I'd also like to conclude that it's really important that we don't stick with our usual patter in terms of explaining genomics and to have the confidence to break out of the traditional medical models of explaining genomics. Um, it's perfectly acceptable to try new ways to bounce around ideas, to use a whole mixture of um, different explanations and see what fits for the person in front of you. And there are many experts out there already you know, communicating with mainstream audiences and doing it very well. So if you think about the filmmakers, the advertising storytellers, the journalists, all of them playing a part in popular culture. And that's where a lot of genomic information is, is getting out to people. And so we have quite a lot to learn from how they're doing that and to bring the best bits into our practice because we all have a duty to socialise genomics for patients and public so that they can make the choices that are right for them and they can make the most of the technology. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful society and ethics research team that I have the privilege of leading. We're a very multidisciplinary group. We bring together the skills of genetic counselling, social science, psychology, anthropology, sociology, epidemiology, um, and also filmmaking. And it's this eclectic mix that helps us to do the research that we do to really try and understand how to communicate well with patients and public audiences and to work out the impact of genetic technology on people. Cool.